the unique experience and challenges of Indigenous Canadians living with diabetes. Sasha Delorme is the mother of Brayson, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2014. She herself was recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Sasha is passionate about raising awareness about the condition and improving health outcomes for people living with diabetes through sharing her experience. She is a member of the Diabetes Action Canada Indigenous Patient Circle and sits on the committees for multiple research projects. Mike Alexander is an Anishinaabe artist and athlete, originally from Swan Lake First Nation in Treaty 1 Territory. He currently lives in Kamloops, BC. Mike is a 60s scoop survivor who struggled with major depression and addiction before his type 2 diabetes diagnosis. Mike has now completed four triathlons and is a grassroots rider for Easton Cycling. He is a Diabetes Action Canada patient partner. Hi, we're the DeLormes and we're from Regina, Saskatchewan. And we're here to share our story with you beautiful people. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grayson and I'm nine and I got type 1 diabetes when I was two. Hi, my name is Shaden and I'm 11 years old. Hi, my name is Steve, and I'm from the Kauzas First Nation. And I'm Sasha. I am 33 years old, and I'm a patient partner with Diabetes Action Canada. We're here today to tell you our story. When Brayson was diagnosed, his blood sugars were 55. We had no family history of type 1 diabetes, and we were only 27 and 30 years old at the time, left to figure it out on our own. We started our journey on Humalog and Humalin N, which required a very strict eating schedule. This lasted for three years. Once we found a good pediatrician for Brayson, uh, we switched over to Lantus and Humalog, which gave our entire family more freedom when it came to meal times and snack times. We were able to eat when we wanted to. In 2017, we were able to get coverage for the Dexcom CGM. This improved our entire family's quality of life. We didn't have to pull Brayson aside uh, to check for blood sugars and he felt more like his friends without that extra attention. It also allowed us to see the way that different foods affected his sugars. In December of 2018, we decided to collect all of Brayson's test strips and needle tips for one month. And when we realized how many we collected, we felt pretty bad for making him go through all of that. We had saved 123 test strips and 239 needles in just one month. Before that moment, we hadn't considered a pump for Brayson because A, we didn't totally test, trust technology, and B, because we were confident in the way that we had managed his diabetes. Now fast forward to May 2019. We had talked with Brayson's endocrinologist and mentioned how we wanted to be trained on the pump. We also mentioned at that time that Brayson hadn't gained any weight in the last three years, so they decided to do some extra blood work before our pump training. Uh, soon after that, we found out that Brayson has celiac. We then had our pump training and celiac education in August, one week before school started. The pump requires only one type of fast-acting insulin. So over the last seven years, we felt like we tried all the different insulin combinations. Which brings us to the next part of our journey. In August 2020, last year, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I recognized some of the symptoms earlier over the summer, but being a caregiver, I put my own health on the back burner until one night I was very ill and had to go to the hospital. I went from constant headaches, extreme thirst, and problems with my vision to a slow and steady improvement once I started taking insulin. I'm now on metformin and Traceba, and it has made me feel healthy again. It's amazing what insulin does for your body when you're either not producing it at all or your body doesn't know how to use it properly. Without the discovery of insulin 100 years ago, as scary as it is to think, our son wouldn't be here with us today. So we celebrate this gift that our Canadian heroes have given to the world. What is, what is something funny that has happened to you at school? Well, one day when I was lining up to go inside from a recess, I, I was going down, so then I told a teacher. She, she told me to have a sip of water, but I thought it was funny because I need sugar when, whenever I'm dropping down. What is something you've missed out on since the pandemic? 
decamps and decamps is because I'm just like everyone else and everyone else has diabetes just like me. What do you find challenging about being a sibling of a person with type 1 diabetes? Well, how it's kind of challenging because you have to wait for the other person to like come down to have like a snack or any type of meal. What is something positive that our family had because of diabetes? Well, honestly, it's kind of cool because you can meet more people and make new friends with type 1 diabetes and see what they have faced in their life. Uh, my name is Mike Alexander. I am originally from Swan Lake First Nation in Manitoba. I um, grew up in, in Winnipeg and am currently living in Kamloops, BC. I uh, live with type 2 uh, diabetes and I am also a uh, four-time uh, triathlon finisher. So I was diagnosed uh, with type 2 diabetes when I was uh, 40 years old. Um, you know, there came a point in my life when um, I needed to make some huge transformations in my life. And I had probably been type two for, for some time and just kind of afraid to, to get that looked at, afraid to have that checked out. Um, but when I did, you know, it was instantly um, a really awful feeling to know that, oh my gosh, my life is over or my life expectancy is, is really low now. Um, but that actually sort of triggered this thing in me um, that caused me to decide to do something about it. Um, you know, I felt like I was given a second chance and that with this diagnosis, I could actually sort of um, make some positive changes in my life. And, you know, that sort of um, meant that I started, you know, uh, taking a closer look at my diet. Um, just because it's vegetarian doesn't mean it's good for me um you know so i maintain a, a vegetarian diet now but certainly um, a closer look at uh, carbohydrate intake is uh, a huge part of my reality and as well um, i started you know riding a bike um a road bike and then started uh, running and started swimming and sort of combined all three of those into one so that I could, you know, compete in, in triathlon, just sort of um, because I wanted to sort of see what the limits are, like how far can I push myself, like what can people with diabetes accomplish in life? And as far as I can tell, there's not very much holding me back from, from doing, you know, anything that I want. Um, well, I mean, I sort of uh, was separated from my family and community and language at birth. So I grew up in uh, Winnipeg and was part of the 60s scoop. Um, so I didn't know my family. I didn't know my health, you know, history as far as my genetics was concerned. I don't know my blood type. You know, I, there's things in life that I sort of feel like I didn't learn about um, until maybe it was too late about how to um, to live well and to live healthy. So this sort of process of um, removing the child from the family is part of the colonial experience that I have to sort of um, better understand and to sort of resist and to sort of take steps in my life to ensure that I can live well and live healthy. And so realizing that decolonizing my diet um, is a huge part of that uh, process for me. Yeah, like um, it's not the end of the world. You know, it can be the start of a brand new world, um, a really awesome fulfilling life and um, I think that with a positive mental attitude and the, the sense that we can do great things um, you know diabetes doesn't have to be the the death sentence that people are afraid that it is um, people can do amazing things uh, people can live really well and um, it can be a really great thing to overcome you know that's uh, have that sense of accomplishment over overcoming things that um, that can be a challenge.
I think it's a really exciting thing to sort of uh, understand that, you know, uh, science is this really important part of, you know, existence on this world that through evidence-based, uh, you know, research and uh, new discoveries are being made that sort of ensure that we can uh, live to our fullest for as long as, as possible. And without insulin, certainly a huge segment of the of uh, Canadian society would be um, maybe not even with us. <laughs> so the idea of um, these uh, researchers and scientists and, and people doing the, the work of making things more possible for us is really exciting to me. Hello, I'm Sasha Delorme. I'm from the Diabetes Action Canada Patient Partners, and I am here to answer any questions that you might have from our video with uh, Mike Alexander. We had a question about how you might incorporate some traditional Indigenous uh, diet or therapies or other um, non-Western kind of approaches to diabetes in your lives. Yeah. Um... I think that uh, issues of, uh, you know, food sovereignty and food security are um, important for us. And when I was filmed sort of talking about uh, vegetarianism being uh, one of the things that I do um, just in terms of nutrition, um, I neglected to mention that, um, you know, out in BC, we have uh, or folks out here really consider uh you know, fish to be a sacred part of an important part of uh, of the the local diet, um, and so I sort of make an exception to the vegetarian rule if um, I know where the fish came from. And you know, I once had an experience of some guy um, the reserve bring up a tray of of things that he just caught, you know, that morning, um, and I thought that was such a blessing and that was such a gift. So to sort of look at traditional foods as um, staples of, of our diet. I think great sources of protein, you know, um, in with fish for sure. Um, and I guess, you know, when I think about self-care, when I think about relaxation, when I think about the importance of downtime or whatever, like, you know, trying to meditate, trying to relax, these are as important as, you know, high intensity workouts, you know, and these are, it's important to get rest and it's important to sleep. It's important to stay hydrated. So these are, can be really helpful. Question for you, Sasha. Um, and I know this is a difficult one. <laughs> How do you balance type one diabetes and celiac disease for Brayson? Um, it's actually quite a challenge because Brayson is very, very picky. Um, he's extremely picky with his foods. So I guess, the way that we pretty much manage is we base our whole family's meals off of what it is that he'll eat. And it was actually quite a big change when we had to convert from foods with gluten in them to foods without gluten. Um, sugar wise, they have like a totally different impact on his blood sugars. So that was a big learning curve. Um, I would just suggest, you know, there are so many different things to fight about with kids when it comes to type 1 diabetes. And I think that food being the major one, um, it's just one of those things that we just kind of go with what he likes. And then we don't have any worries about, you know, dangerous, scary lows or anything like that. So it's it's based a lot off of him. Um, and he's still a child. So as he gets older, I think that that will change. And we've got one last question for those of us, um, maybe from outside Canada or some of us who haven't caught up with our, our history and terminology. Um, so Mike, could you explain the 60s scoop, um, what it was and what you think the main message is that you have learned from that experience or that you'd like to share with others that would help us to understand um, that type of historical trauma? I might uh, miss a couple of obvious things just because I tend to um, when I'm sort of prompted to talk. But essentially, the 60s scoop was, uh, uh, you know, a government uh, approved, um, mandated sort of removal of uh, First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit uh, children from their home, uh, from their families, from their community, whereby they would be adopted into uh, non-native uh, households, in my case or they'd be sent to foster care um, in other cases, 
either way, there's a severing of, um, you know, that individual from their uh, worldview and their ability to sort of uh, exist, um, which, you know, uh, across the board when I talk with 60 scoop survivors induces uh, lifelong sort of trauma that a person then has to deal with uh, or not deal with, I guess. And um, it's an extension of the residential school experience, which was another attempt of forced assimilation uh, by the Canadian government um, and, you know, uh, enacted by the church in order to, um, remove the Indian from the child in uh, both cases. So um, in a nutshell, that's that's it. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, very difficult story for you. And uh, I think it's it's so important that people understand that there are many reasons why individuals' lifestyles and the route in which um, one ends up uh, struggling with diabetes has many, many other roots, um, not just genetic. And now we're going to pass things along to our next segment on, um, on the advances in the treatment of diabetes um, and where, where we've come from, where we're going to. I'll hand that over to the next segment.